नमस्ते प्रसाद जी नमस्ते एंड थैंक यू फॉर गिफ्टिंग एस विद दिस वंडरफुल ऑपरचुनिटी ऑफ ऑफ एक्सचेंजिंग विद यू लर्निंग फ्रॉम यू थैंक यू सो मच माय प्लेजर हेमंत लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू इट या uh prasad ji i was fortunate that uh, in preparation for this interaction i was able to go through some of your videos uh the presentation you made at msr uh couple of uh, dialogues that you had at the brand call you and uh, your google talk interesting google talk your ted talks couple of ted talks and i'll plug them in 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 this uh, conversation in the edit portion uh i was i was curious uh, prasad ji to understand uh, if if there are any memories that you could share with us about your formative years about your childhood and uh what kind of semblance around wisdom or applied wisdom did you have uh, or if you have a memory of them the memories i have go back to my conversations are observations around my grandparents both my maternal grandfather uh, and a, a paternal grandmother uh, maternal grandfather was a retired tahsildar and uh, he was in his uh, early 60s and uh, he was a scholar he had written um critical thinking essays uh with a group of people with a pseudonym they were writing social commentary he with a pseudonym called vadaru bothu vadaru bothu means chatterbox so uh, among the eight people uh, they look at Uh, what's going on in society what's go- going on in the politics and culture and write a critical commentary on what's going on and uh, so he was a not very talkative quiet uh, reflective person and uh, uh, so you know he did not necessarily go out a lot but he thought about and he was reflective in a sense that he used to sit at one place meditate pray and write and uh, play with us whatever on one side on the other side my i don't remember my paternal grandfather but my grandmother on the other hand was a person who studied enough that uh, every evening when i you know go to her place when i go to the um place where they were staying or at least my my grandfather had passed away my grandmother was staying she reads um, bhagavatam for a for an hour there will be a bunch of people who will come in Uh, whether they are uh, vendors vegetable sellers uh, and na- neighbors some other people will come in she will read uh, a small section of it and explain it and discuss it with them and uh, she was very good in uh, negotiating in the sense you know bartering okay you do this i will do this for you i'll give you this old clothes you give me those type of stuff or get some mangoes or get uh, peanuts and uh, she was as opposed to my maternal grandfather she was very affectionate very connected loving and she did not come across as a scholar or as a thinker but she wore her heart on her sleeve and uh, and i had a lot of freedom to explore experiment and uh, play and learn so there are lots of things i learned when i visit her in summer uh, most of the time so i could just go stay with my grandmother 
and uh, play with the neighborhood kids and uh, ex explore we created dramas all kinds of thing so in some so in terms of wisdom i found both reflective contemplative meditative way of integrating life into oneself and writing as a reflection from my grandfather and uh, playful giving freedom supporting my joy with no boundaries no questions uh, and uh, large amount of uh, love as the primary medium through which i was nurtured uh, and at the same time both of them had certain uh, the ability to read reflect comment upon so i got two different perspectives and the one most important memory i have from my grandfather was when i was like about 4 years old i think um, <clears throat> and i got pneumonia and my brother had got a pneumonia first and he relapsed so he was pretty much out of it in the sense like he was in not quite coma but he was pretty down in the sense that they had to do you know this is i'm talking 65 years ago uh, so they were actually they cooked the rice and uh, double cooked the rice and they literally wipe and uh, massage his body with the rice with an assumption some nutrition goes through at that level because at that time uh, we didn't have necessarily a drip system to be set up or uh, uh, some kind of a thing and uh, they were give, my grandfather had put me on his lap to give it long tablet i still remember it was blue and yellow uh, antibiotic to uh, get my pneumonia down and when he gave it to me when i tried to take it with water it was not possible because horizontally it was not going into my mouth properly so my grandfather put me on his lap and put it vertically and tried to push it through a little bit and while giving him water while giving me water and then i bit his finger and uh, he just instantaneously he just uh, as a reaction he slapped me and said to me you know look at your brother he has no awareness you are intelligent you know that this medicine helps i know it is difficult but you need to figure out a way to take these things because that will help so you need to use your intelligence to do what is good for you for whatever reason that was something that remained in my mind so the use of intelligence for survival and for growth it is extremely important you can't just say things will happen whatever happens however they happen you need to use whatever intelligence you have to move forward and you need to take that to a certain extent in your own hands i found uh, that incident and that uh, little bit of uh, wisdom interaction that led me to live my life in a particular way both consciously and unconsciously for a very long period of time so fascinating thank you so much for sharing uh, such wonderful spectrum um sometimes it so happens that um, one comes across a particular teaching an aphorism an idea at certain point in life and the person has not is not yet ready for it or maybe doesn't see it in that sense and at some later, later stage the person the same thing comes back and the person is now seeing and sensing and integrating it differently um uh, uh, 
I just, before this conversation, I just searched for books on wisdom on Amazon and it threw up 40,000 books with four star rating and uh, books on religion on Amazon books, again, with four star and plus rating 60,000 books. Um, I was wondering that, uh, I was wondering, there were two or three things that were going on in my mind and I wanted you to guide with your uh, insight is that if it is true that scriptures were written hundreds and thousands of years back and even before the writing tradition there was the oral tradition so these teach there are a set of teachings available to different geographies in different uh, era and yet we find ourselves in the era that we find ourselves in with so much more being written uh, how do you see all of this uh, uh, how would how do you take this data set and process? Uh, what does this data set tell you that these teachings have been around for a long period of time? A lot of people have had exposure. People around those people have had an exposure. A lot of people uh, left a particular tradition and went to some other tradition. A lot of these kind of journeys have happened, and the naysayers would have happened. Critiques would have happened, uh, and 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 we find ourselves in the era we find ourselves in. Uh, how do you see all of this? Uh, does this speak to you in some sense? So when you ask me a question like that, there are two images that come to my mind. One was when I traveled around, when I went to Pompeii in Greece or uh, when I went to Olympia in Greece or when I went to Oxford or Cambridge and uh, when I looked at uh, King Arthur's places, when you look at the villages or campus, if you want to call for, you know, at that time palaces and then the whole thing. Similarly, now places like Ayodhya, you know, and Farhanpur around it, now that's also part of Ayodhya. And uh, where was Bharat Kund? Where was Ayodhya? Where was uh, Sarayu River? Where was... And then compared to that, uh, where are, uh, you know, the various places like Lanka, looking at that. Or Madurai Temple. And the whole uh, various places around, you know, how the temple itself was like a pranganam, as they call it in Sanskrit. And when you have so many stores and houses and in this uh, sanctum sanctorum by several uh, groups of, uh, you know, the various kinds of layers of temple architecture that come in and uh, multiple type thing. I realized that at one time around the world, not just uh, in Greece or UK or United States, of course, United States didn't exactly exist in the same way. Uh, it was not discovered, but you know, mostly by Native Americans at that time. But if you take the ancient civilizations, India, China, uh, Greece, uh, Italy, where, uh, UK, when you look at them, I found that they were all centered around uh, certain places and then it spread where Socrates was or where, you know, uh, India, the Ramayana, Krishna, Madhura or when you look at, there were centers of learning and around which things spread or there were kings like Vijayanagara Samrajyam, they call like in the south. So Krishna Devaraya. So there were a few pe learned people or scholars or teachers or uh, um, you might call uh, researchers or kings who supported large amount of reflection and thinking or even monasteries or temples, spiritual places. Why am I spending so much of time looking at all this is, it was not located to, it happened only around a temple or it happened only around a university or it happened only around a kingdom or it happened only around a certain 
town or a village or a city. No, there were in different cultures, different places of communities evolved. And those communities had rules for dialogue. What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? What are the ways in which you engage in a conversation and win, lose? For example, Shankaracharya, when you look at how he went to North and worked with Mandana Misra and how Mandana Misra's wife was actually a person who decided on who won and who lost. Adjudicators. Right. And uh, so there are the Socratic dialogues. Or, you know, even in the recent periods, Jiddu Krishnamurti, when he had dialogues with David Bohm or scholars in UK or Brockwood Park in, uh, uh, you know, near, uh, uh, in, in UK or California, like at Ohio, California, or in India, Rishi Valley, or uh, Pune, or any of those things. There was a tradition of deep, meaningful conversations, not with a large number of people, but with certain people who have passed a certain level of intellectual rigor or they passed a muster as scholars or as thinkers or as uh, researchers or as experts. And the conversations took place with them. And those resulted in meaningful wisdom that emerged without polarization. They created a middle ground. And that middle ground embraced both extreme edges. And that became a foundation for some theory or certain model and uh, that evolved in some way. Like for example, Sankaracharya, when he looked at different traditions in Hinduism and he looked at some people worship Ganesha, some people worship uh, Shakti, some people worship Vishnu, some people worship, you know, um, Ishan, uh, you know, Ishwar, and uh, uh, then uh, Surya, he brought them together. He created Panchayatana or Shanmatas. He began to integrate and create a foundation for what we later called uh, Sanatana Dharma or uh, to a certain extent, Hinduism, that evolved and that integrated. And in doing so, there was a way of integrating all sides, all views in a particular way. For example, uh, temp I mean, the priests from Kerala became uh, what you call priests in Badarikashram, in the northernmost country, or people from the north, they came to um, Sringeri. You know, when he established, there was a way in which south, north, east, west, uh, different traditions, different ways. And uh, so some of the Shankaracharya disciples worship Vishnu, but they say, Hari, 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 Hari. So that Shiva and Vishnu, there were no conflicts in that particular one. And by the way, similarly, there were, you know, whether you talk about Aristotle or whether you talk about Socrates or whether you talk about, there was an integration of knowledge that resulted in both practical wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Of course, in um, the Greek mythology and some of them, they talk about it as Sophia, as the spiritual wisdom, and Phronesis, as the practical wisdom. And there were distinctions and there was a respect for both kinds. One resulted in scholarship and uh, various books and, you know, various other scriptures that came out. And other people who made great progress in agriculture or in business or in uh, 
medicine or in yoga or in uh, something else you know chanakya's arthashastra is an example or patanjali's yoga sutras is an example you know so there was there were practical shastras darshana shastras as we call smritis we call manusmriti parasara smriti some of them and then there were shrutis which were source of knowledge but they were for paramarthika purpose not for vyavaharika purpose not for practical day to day living but for spiritual growth and for going beyond the life mukti or moksha or whatever we want to call and there was equal respect for them there was wisdom in both of them and they were all created as a certain you know uh, you know what you might call a hierarchy of uh, vedas and uh, upanishads and vedangas and upangas and darshana shastras and itihasas you know like that there was a beautiful de derivation of knowledge all the way from vyasa who is supposed to have organized the vedas into four vedas so the wisdom as we call was not about how many books are written and how many how much data points you have how many views we have for what we have but actually who are the people who are viewing there was a certain what we call right now like you know hey in linkedin they say would you like to be uh, would you like to pay this money and you will be credentialed or you know there are ways in which these uh, what you might call top voices or these experts or these uh, people who have remarkable following if they say something to you if they follow you then you are blessed you know somehow your book will get value your interview gets viewed or um, it what do we call right it goes viral as the language we call so there is a period in which credential experts thoughtful leaders scholars when they actually critically reviewed examined integrated reflected upon that made to be part of the wisdom tradition or wisdom or even knowledge for that matter but now we don't have that we don't have those touch stones we don't have the critical the ability to differentiate between truth and untruth between eternal truth and temporary truth between tradition that established and worked for a long period of time versus something that has emerged in the current moment but that has still a lot of value for example i mentioned shankaracharya before he proposed advaita philosophy for a very long period of time and we talk about how you become a scholar how you become a uh, what you call a pandita how you become known there are you know you need, you know so you will be called a jagat guru if you write uh, commentary on prasthana trayam dasopanishad ten upanishads vedas or at brahma sutras and then uh, uh, what you might call a the various commentaries which you bhagavad gita when you do all of these then you are recognized as a teacher of certain standing for a world teacher but uh, now any tom dick and harry can do that and they can look at they can take ai generative ai integrate some of this and then create something that can also the pattern recognition which was not possible at one time is possible but intellect and intelligence are being mistaken on one side and the other side there are people like for example ramakrishna paramahamsa did not have a lineage uh, jiddu krishna murti did not necessarily have a lineage ramana maharshi 
was a person who did not have a known teacher for him. But those are people who have evolved, who have transcended. They are supposed to be people to a certain extent in different traditions, considered to be holy people because how they looked at who they are, what they communicated, seems to be in resonance with what has evolved as Sastras. But there are tons of gurus now. There are tons of experts now. And uh, how do you really differentiate information that is meaningful? What data is relevant and appropriate to be counted upon? What is considered as a useful, meaningful knowledge? Vidya. What is the Vidya that you talk about? And of course, there are two kinds of Vidyas, Paravidya and Aparavidya. The Aparavidya is the Vidya that will help us to prosper and grow and learn and do things on this world. And the other kind of Vidya, Paravidya, will, that will lead you to transcend and go beyond and transform who you are into spiritual domain, integrate the spirituality with the practicality. There isn't any yardstick or a touchstone. So when data, information and knowledge that leads to any of these, and if the values themselves are mixed up, then wisdom, which is supposed to be based on discernment and discrimination and uh, the applied knowledge with appropriate values inculcated, where is the way in which you can measure what is the right knowledge? So there are tons of books on wisdom, but do they make you wiser? Tons of books on uh, what is considered to be any of them, but do they, do they build on body of knowledge? Do they apply to, if you create a theory, is that theory, like if I write a theory, is that theory only for Indians, for Americans, for whites, for blacks, for male, for female, for youth? Have I really thought through that if, if I speak something as a truth, if I pontificate something, does that have, you know, ability to prove the past, validate the past, create and predict the future and make sense in the present moment? If they are not there, then uh, I have a feeling what we are creating are large number of books. Most of these books probably are vanity publishings. And these days, there are less and less number of people who read the books from beginning to the end. For example, I myself, when I wrote From Smart to Wise, I sent out to 200 people copies, free copies, I sent it out. And after about a year, I checked how many of them read the whole book from beginning to the end. I was aghast at the small number of uh, people who have completed it. So I found people like in capsule, they want it in 30 second capsules. Uh, they would love to read one page, at the most three pages summary. And uh, what it used to be, you watch for an hour, 10 years ago. Then it became 18 minutes in a TED talk. From there, it became nine minutes. Now you want it in a TikTok in a 30 seconds or in a one minute. If it is more than that, people don't have any patience. So... As we evolve, our attention, our brain capacity, how we use it has changed. So wisdom itself, as we consider it, that's why I ask a question. For what purpose? Who is the audience? Why are you doing this? Because uh, it can make a big difference. 
I wanted to connect this back to, uh, so actually just staying with this, given, given this being the era that we are in, uh, where there are these challenges, uh, there is one more thing that I wanted to, uh, wanted you to weigh in on. Um, you know, 100 years back, I remember listening to a talk by uh, British philosopher Roman Kaznarik, and he incidentally mentioned in one of his talk that just about 100 years back, you looked at the planet and the planet had 200 different kinds of jobs. And you look at the planet right now, it has 12,000 different kinds of jobs. Uh, and the question that he posed was, has the increased number of jobs increased sense of satisfaction and meaning and purpose for people? And then if that be the case, then why does Gallup show huge disengagement levels of employees, even in fortune companies? And then why the sale of self-help books and these guru retreats? Uh, there was one hypothesis that I, I had, and it's one of the factors that I believe, is that uh, probably a hundred years back, a lot of us would physically interface with the world. You know, we were doing things with things, hands and legs, motor functions, doing things with things. And I could produce something and bring it to you. You could touch feel. You had some kind of tangibility that you could weigh in on. But now what we're doing is there is a layer of population that physically interfaces with the physical world. And there's a huge layer of population which is just uh, dealing with concepts and judgments and opinions. So we are dealing with large scale inter intangibility and intersubjectivity. And I believe that we are not trained good enough for how to deal with them, how to exchange them how to have exploratory depth and explanatory depth in each of them. Uh, wanted to hear your thoughts on agree agreement, disagreement, or if you want to build on this. I agree with you. These days, uh, what we consider as experience is many times uh, very shallow. We never meet such people but we have deep conversations. But those conversations, when we do it on the phone, when we do it on the Zoom, in a particular artificial context. And that context might or might not shape the depth of conversation. We did for past three, four years um, in the Institute of Indic Wisdom, we had some pretty profound conversations online with people whom we have never met in person and created some deep relationships. So I know it is possible, but it is rare. It is because there is no physical connection. There is a possibility for intellectual and to a certain extent emotional connect that can come about, but that emotional connect is not emerging from breathing together, sharing the same room, uh, you know, sharing the same food, sharing the same space. So there may be some things which are getting to be missing. So now coming back to the perspective that you are bringing in, yes, when we talk about employee engagement, when we talk about virtual teaming, when we talk about uh, abstractions and uh, concepts being a way of connecting rather than sharing together certain data, observing the same data, experiencing the same data, and then interpreting that data in different ways, and then discussing the differences in those interpretations completely based on the shared experience and seeing how those two different conceptualizations that could result out of shared experience, the abstraction that we create will have a lot more depth to it. But right now, without that shared experience, data and information are missing or data and information are provided in a way that both of us can relate to and we are going from there. So that means we are not starting from data, information, knowledge, let us say the concepts are knowledge, 
um, blocks, if you want to call it. So we are actually starting at knowledge and trying to create wisdom out of it, creating abstractions. We are not starting at the fundamental building block of shared experience, the sensorial perceptions and the emotional reactions and uh, how, you know, if, you know, like for example, when I was uh, developing some leadership programs in Boeing, I was one of the external consultants and along with me there was another person called Nancy uh, who was coming in from Ford and she was another external consultant. And what was interesting was so when we go for these meetings, all day meetings, they start with a breakfast uh, you know being offered. So there are muffins, there are donuts and bakery goods like that. And then there are some fruits, uh, there are some cheeses and some coffee. So it was interesting that I was actually going for a lot of fruits and a little bit of cheese and crackers. And I did find there were some people who will only take the top of the muffin. Every day I see like a couple of muffins, their tops are taken out, but the remaining portion of the muffin was left behind. So after about two weeks of these kinds of meetings, I checked around. Who is this who takes just the top of the muffins and leaves the rest of the muffin behind? And why do you do that? That led to a very interesting story from one more of the person. And then they asked the question, how come you don't eat the bagels and the donuts and the muffins? Uh, why do you go for the fruits? And that led to recognizing where they grew up with, what their childhood memories are, what are the beliefs, you know, uh, and how those beliefs kind of lead people uh, into certain ways of thinking, certain ways of being, certain ways of relating. And uh, that was a very, very meaningful one that led us to come up with a whole different module which led um, us to really take these Boeing executives into some nearby schools which were like a lower middle class schools. How the teachers don't get enough supplies and they spend their own money every year to, to accommodate what is needed in the classroom. And how does the principal deal with these uh, low income, uh, crime ridden neighborhoods, the children that are coming from there and how does that person work? And how does another school, which is a preppy, expensive, private school children and their principal, what are the kinds of things that they work. So we began to develop those modules because we got engaged in something completely relevant. Like why do you prefer the bakery goods or why do you prefer cheese and uh, crackers? Why do you prefer fruits and why are you a vegetarian? Why are you a vegan and why are you, uh, you know, carnivorous. So that is unavailable if we say, you know what, employee engagement. Here is the data. Here is the company. It is like saying, I have gotten from all my competitors. So I want you to decide why in my industry, the employee engagement is so and so, so and so. You know what, you need to go down a little deeper. You need to look at it from not just your industry, but from your region, but other kinds of things. Maybe you need to even look at educational institution. Maybe you need to look at what is happening in terms of engagement in uh, uh, what you might call political organizations, schools or in churches. What is happening after COVID? 
Is there more number of people who are coming to sermons on Sunday or do they want Zoom sermons? And if everybody is having difficulty to bring people back from COVID to do in-person work in companies, if you say, you know what, I don't care about the rest of the people. I need people to come to my company and be here because my belief is when we are all together and when we go to lunch together and when we go to common kitchen or when we have these conversations, you become creative. You know what? That's exactly something that many people in many disciplines in many industries share. But if they are able to do something else and if the youth permanently are unwilling to engage in person, they only want to do through online and they believe they are no longer committed to spending from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., whatever are the times that you do, and then say, whatever we can do. No, no, no. You want these deliverables, we will deliver it, but don't count us based on time and money. It is not no longer based on how many hours we work and how we work, but what outcomes are you producing? And so that means the metrics by which we need to measure have come about not because the work has changed, but because the context in which the work is being done is changed. And that context has altered the past and has created a future that nobody imagined. And it was because of some virus or, you know, called COVID. Now, but if I were to say, for 2000 years, this is how we worked. And I have a long amount of data on how it is, but I want it to come back. You know what? Data doesn't make any difference here. The, once the context changes, the transformation has taken place. It is like a mind once stretched beyond its comfort zone, it will never be the same again. You have changed minds. You have transformed people's mindsets. How can you go back and say the old data? That is old data. It is no longer relevant unless you change the context, change the mindset. You cannot talk about same employee engagement or uh, same ways of working because these are like a holonic systems. You know, the wisdom is like a whole on. It's a whole and it's a part. These are systems that we are operating from. But you need to understand the systemic behaviors, not individual behaviors. I don't think many of the people are really thinking through context, intent, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the frameworks, mindsets, and uh, productivity, efficiency, and uh, metrics. Interesting. Interesting. These are all interdependent. So many things uh, coming up when uh, you were sharing this, uh, uh, Prasadji. Uh, I'll take a minute and just uh, index them and then maybe if you want to speak to any of them. Um, your muffin example is so interesting. I'm reminded of a couple of friends of ours, uh, Ian, uh, Ian and Jason from New Jersey. They run an organization called Emergent Futures Lab. And they, run, they, they basically base their entire idea on, on some core principles, like one coming from evolution called exaptation. Uh, you know, the wings of the birds were not intended, the, the initial intended function of wings were not for flying, it was some other purpose. But then uh, over a period of time, it exacted. It did not adapt. It exacted into another function. So similarly, your muffin example is something which exacted, you know, something which was intended for a purpose, but it, you took it to another purpose because of the conditions you created in the system in some sense. Um, the second thing that came up for me recently, I was listening to uh, Econ Talk uh, podcast uh, by Russ Roberts, uh, economist Russ Roberts, and he had a Utah professor, uh, Depo Felin, 
uh, who's recently written an essay on uh, you know AI and its capabilities, and he's exactly coming to the same conclusion that you are suggesting that uh, all that the AI is able to do is gather a lot of data points, but those data points are of the past, the past combinations and permutations, and and that that may not give uh, a degree a, ch a change in kind a change in you know a kind of thing and he cites some wonderful examples of wright brothers and galileo that all the data points that were available to them uh, always pointed to the direction of the conventional and they could not uh, take anything which is on the other direction so just these two things came up for me uh, the question the curiosity that i have is uh, there's an interesting saying which goes by when uh, when managers are not, when when managers cannot measure what they want, they end up wanting what they can measure. Uh, so so you you get a you get a system where you over index the system around certain vocabulary, certain measurement, but it becomes the target and people can easily gain that. Given that this is the case, given that there is a kind of momentum towards how corporate a functioning, there is Wall Street pressure, there is social pressure, keeping up with Jonas's pressure, uh, and a whole lot of others, you know, pestle factors that are playing in. Uh, how do you think wisdom can, or or how how do you think through this when wisdom can can become their ally and help people uh, move the arc in a certain different direction? Um, I'm sure Excellent. you think about these things. Yeah, I do think about these things quite a bit. One of the things um, what you mentioned uh, regarding acceptation rather than adaptation, I have I looked at it as a learning that leads to skill building and competency learning that leads to transformation, uh, mindset change. So actually, interestingly, of course, in Indian spirituality, we call it Aparavidya and Paravidya. Aparavidya will allow you to re, I mean, what you call reorganize data, information and knowledge, skills, knowledge and competence in a way that would make us become an expert in what is already available. That is what uh, current AI, even the generative AI is able to do because it can recognize the patterns because it has got access to a vast amount of data, you know, millions of times larger than it is available to any individual human. When that is available, you can come up with the patterns and uh, ways of looking at it surprisingly different than what it is. But it is still based on the past, as you rightly pointed out. It is based on existing data points. Like when uh, I used to consult with Boeing, we used to use a proverb. If you keep improving the railroad systems, Suddenly, one day, rail will not, I mean, railroad system will not fly and become an airplane. So that means there are certain fundamental grounding assumptions that trains and they go on rails. Rails are the foundation on which all the transport work. That's what makes it a railroad system. Until and unless you take away the rails, which are invisible. It's like uh, water to fish. You know, fish doesn't know what water is. So we operate with a certain set of hidden assumptions, unconscious set of competencies, and uh, unconscious set of belief system until we shift that. So that means continuous learning is about learning what is around us, how to deal with the world in which we live so that we can be better and we can make the world better. That is where the skills, knowledge and competencies are all about. But when we can observe the world that has not been observed before, that is ourselves, 
the intrinsic or, or you might call it inside out learning. When we begin to not focus on the vast amount of data that is out there that the generative AI or the AI can gather all the data that is out there, but actually look at it and say, what set of eyes am I looking at? Like uh, when I went to somebody's house, he pointed to me, a 12 year old kid. Why are you wearing these glasses which have got a chip on, you know, one side? Can you, how do you even look through that? I realized that I broke those glasses about six weeks ago while I was traveling I, and I did not stay in any one place long enough to have a chance to get them fixed because wherever I went, they said I need two days or three days to fix it and I could not necessarily stay that long time because I was giving some talks and I was visiting people and I was going. So over the six week period, I got used to actually looking through a broken glass on my right eye. I saw the world just fine. Only thing is, all these people were looking at it and saying, why the hell this guy is going around with a broken glass chipped in his right eye and he keeps on, doesn't he have money? Or or is he such a conjuice that whatever money he doesn't want to spend? Or he's just strange. All this might have been looked at, but I never paid attention to that. Because I was so busy doing what I was doing, I was not looking at myself. And it took a kid to put a mirror and say, you know, hey, look at yourself. And I realize the world is like that. The world I, I see is not the world that is out there. And the world you see and the world I see are very different. And that means if I change myself, I change the world. So if I change the eyes through which I look at the world and if I get a new set of glasses, the world is very changed. Like uh, recently when I was in India, my aunt, you know, she had been struggling with uh, cataract for past three, four years. Her husband passed away and she lives in a small village and she needed support for somebody to put the uh, drops and all of them for a month. So she didn't get the uh, cataract done. So when I was there, I had a chance to take her and get one of the eyes and operated upon. It was like unbelievable difference for her. She said, oh, I didn't even see that, you know, in my house, all these things are not cleaned or dirty or something else, something else. And by the way, I didn't even see so bright colors. The world was completely muted and dull and all merged into one after another. But I was make sense of that particular one. I didn't realize the world is so clear and so different. And it was like, I mean, like the entire day, she's 75 years old. She's actually going to various rooms and going to various places and going outside, going inside. And she's actually looking at it in a very different way. By the way, I just realized. Do you, I have, have, you have a hard stop? stop. <laughs> you have a hard I stop. had a hard stop. I can come back to you and continue in another part if you like. But yeah, I have. We should do part. that. I'll write back to you and sync up, sync up another time with you. Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome.